Hi everybody, Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College and we've reached the very last brain video which is going to focus on all the various ways that our brain, our very delicate brain, is protected from the environment. There are some obvious things that protect the brain, of course, such as the scalp, even the hair on our scalp, the skull bones. But if we go deeper now, we get to these connective tissue membranes that we call the meninges. The singular version for meninges is meninx. We have three different types of meninges, which we will discuss soon. The cerebrospinal fluid also provides a form of protection, as we'll see. And then finally, there is the so-called blood-brain barrier, or the BBB. So if we were to penetrate the skin on our head, then we would quickly run into the periosteum of the flat bones, then the bone um, tissue, followed by the rest of the periosteum, and then we're going to end up in the um, meninges. And so we have three meninges, from most superficial to deeper, we have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and pia mater. And these are spelled, that is the term mater, is spelled with just one T. This literally means mother in Latin. The dura mater, literally meaning the tough mother, as in to endure, to uh, toughen it out. Arachnoid refers to spider, and pia refers to peaceful or delicate. So these meninges not just cover our brain and also the spinal cord, by the way, but they also form folds that go deep within the fissures, as we'll see. They also protect blood vessels and enclose what we call the venous sinuses. We'll see what those are. And they are arranged such that there are space, or there is space in between them where cerebrospinal fluid can flow. So we're going to see that cerebrospinal fluid is not just present deep inside of the brain in the spinal cord, that is in the ventricles and in the central canal, but we're going to find the cerebrospinal fluid also flowing around the brain and around the spinal cord in a space created by the meninges. Let's get started with the dura mater. And the dura mater actually consists of two layers. So let's take a look at the bottom picture. So right here we have our bone, our flat bone. And remember that all flat bones are covered on both sides by periosteum. So there would be periosteum here in the black, P for periosteum. And we would have periosteum here as well. And notice that we have one of the arrows of the dura mater pointing there. So that layer is literally the periosteum, the inner periosteum of our flat bone. And we refer to that layer of the dura mater as the periosteal layer or the periosteal dural layer, you could almost call it as well. Then we're going to have a bit of space and that space is filled with venous blood, meaning blood that is going to return to the heart. It's filled with blood from veins. And therefore, the next layer of the dura mater is literally going to follow the shape of our brain. By that I mean the following. So allow me to now use a different color. I'll use bright green, which will really stand out. So this is the other layer of the dura mater and it is going to dip into our longitudinal fissure here on both sides here. So the inner layer of the dura mater forms this fold in the longitudinal fissure, and we'll also see this happening in the transverse fissure. These folds have names. We'll look at that in just a moment. Because of this arrangement of the 
periosteal layer, P for the periosteal layer, as well as the meningeal layer, which is the one in the green here, right there. Um, because of that arrangement, we're going to literally create a pocket here where venous blood can hang out for a bit. And we call these pockets that form dural sinuses. And this particular dural sinus right here, we call the superior sagittal sinus because of its location. So if this is our longitudinal fissure here, then we have one cerebral hemisphere here and the other cerebral hemisphere there. And this is the superior portion of the brain, which if we look at our longitudinal fissure, it literally would create a sagittal cut of the brain. And that's probably part of the reason why we call this the superior sagittal sinus. So it belongs to a series of what we call dural sinuses. All of this blood in these dural sinuses is ultimately going to be returned to the heart via the so-called jugular veins. Now the picture in the upper right corner here shows you that in addition to the superior sagittal sinus, see now how you can follow the length of the superior sagittal sinus, we have other dural sinuses and I'm not asking you to remember their names or their locations this is just to help you visualize all of these sinuses better so a sinus is literally a very dilated sac-like vein um, so here we have another one here we have another one another one etc you can see how they all end in sinus now recall that the inner layer of the dura mater, called the meningeal layer, is going to follow the fissures, particularly the longitudinal fissure, even the transverse fissure, and therefore create these folds. And we have actually three folds. So the fold that we see here, that is the fold that dips into the longitudinal fissure, and that fold we call the falx cerebri. So falx literally means fold. The falx cerebelli is going to run right in the middle of the cerebellum where the two cerebellum bellar hemispheres meet. So it literally runs along that worm-like structure that interconnects the cerebellar hemispheres called the vermis. And it's not illustrated on this particular image because we would need to have the cerebellum in there to really be able to, to show that better. And finally, there's more of a tent-like, a covering-like fold called the tentorium cerebelli. So it's more of a horizontal tent-like dural fold that extends all the way into the transverse fissure, meaning where the cerebrum is separated from the cerebellum. So we see that portions of that tentorium cerebelli here, it's, it's cut somewhat, and also uh, more or less here. My pointer is off in the wrong direction here, you guys. It probably shifted as I moved my the rest of my image, so I'm sorry about that, uh, but you can follow this arrow here. The next Menninx, which sits just deep to the dura mater, is called the arachnoid mater, and the reason why it's called the spider-like layer, arachnoid as in think of arachnophobia, is because it has all these spider leg looking like extensions that protrude into a space. This is a space right here. And that space we call the subarachnoid space. And that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid.
So all through here, we has, have CSF, 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 etc. Okay. Now notice that this arachnoid layer sends these little projections all the way into our dural sinuses. And we refer to these as arachnoid villi. Arachnoid villi, sometimes called arachnoid granulations. And so what is their role? Well, their role is to return the CSF back into the blood. So one of the things to bear in mind, and let me use black arrows so you can see this better, is to not forget that cerebrospinal fluid is constantly made and constantly drained. It's constantly flowing, therefore, as well, and the cilia of the ependymal cells help with that. The moment our cerebrospinal fluid doesn't flow properly anymore, the moment it isn't drained properly anymore, we're going to see major havoc in the brain and possibly major swelling. So right here, where these arachnoid villi meet the blood, we see that the cerebrospinal fluid is dumped into the blood. Now, another thing to take with you as a piece of information that is useful is that bodily fluids typically arise from our blood plasma. So whether we're talking about cerebrospinal fluid or, or the fluid we find in our joints called synovial fluid or even the fluid in our inner ears that play a role in equilibrium, all these fluids are going to be produced by our blood plasma somehow, or our derivatives of our blood plasma. Similar principle here with the cerebrospinal fluid. The other thing to observe here is if cerebrospinal fluid is returned to the blood plasma, and it's made from the blood plasma, where is it made? Because we don't see anything here that seems to be referring to the production of CSF. We're only referring here or indicating here that the CSF is returned to the blood. So hold that thought in mind for an upcoming slide where we will discuss where cerebrospinal fluid is formed. And if you've watched some of my previous videos, you probably already know the answer to that. Our final and deepest and most delicate menanx is called the piamata, literally meaning the peaceful layer. It is going to follow all the sulky and jirai of the brain. So we see it right here. And here, realize that this is our cerebral cortex. This is where our actual nervous tissue starts. And here we have our white matter. It's quite vascularized and it clings on tightly to that cerebral cortex. So now we can finally talk about cerebrospinal fluid in a little bit more detail. For one, we're aware of where it is located. We know by now it's located in the ventricles of the brain, even though we haven't really studied them very carefully yet. We will. It's also located in the central canal. Remember that both these structures are lined with ependymal cells. Ependymal cells, right? I'll abbreviate that. And we also find cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space, which is that space deep to the arachnoid layer, but superficial to the piamates. And the location of that cerebrospinal fluid around the brain in that subarachnoid space creates a situation where our brain is almost kind of floating in our skull.
In other words, that subarachnoid space that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid provides buoyancy to our brain. And therefore, it protects our brain. And this is also the case for the spinal cord, by the way. We also have a subarachnoid space around the spinal cord. So this space that provides buoyancy with the help of the CSF protects our CNS against trauma. So in other words, when you hit your head against the wall, your brain is going to move a little bit, but most of the impact is absorbed by the cerebrospinal fluid. Of course, if the impact is ridiculously intense, as could happen in a car accident where, unfortunately, your skull hits the window really, really hard or the dashboard or the steering wheel really, really hard, then that small amount of cerebrospinal fluid is not going to prevent your brain from getting bruised uh, and that could lead to um, major issues, of course. Now, the cerebrospinal fluid, as I've mentioned before, is derived from our blood plasma, but it has a slightly different composition. In other words, it's not going to have as much protein. Our blood is quite rich in protein, proteins that play a role uh, especially in maintaining the osmotic pressure, uh, play a role in, in blood clotting, play a role in antibodies, things like that. The ion concentrations are also different in the cerebrospinal fluid compared to blood plasma. And unlike our blood, which can change in volume depending on how much water uh, ends up in the blood, the volume of cerebrospinal fluid is kept very constant. It is constantly produced and constantly drained in about the same amount. Anytime there is a significant shift in the volume of our cerebrospinal fluid, we're not going to feel very well at all. And you learn more about this in pathophysiology. Now, Aside from providing protection to our brain with the help of buoyancy, our cerebrospinal fluid also provides nourishment and removes all kinds of waste. Even extra neurotransmitters can be taken care of with the help of the cerebrospinal fluid. So remember the, the topic of this video is to learn about the different modes of protection. And we looked at the meninges, we now mentioned the cerebrospinal fluid and its protective function is primarily in providing that buoyancy. Now to kind of step aside from that buoyancy protective function of the cerebrospinal fluid, let's now take a look at the location of the cerebrospinal fluid inside of the brain and inside of the spinal cord. And so that brings us now to our discussion of the four ventricles located in the brain plus the central canal in the spinal cord. So when we look at the uh, a side view of the brain, so this is a lateral view or a side view of the brain, then we have a lateral ventricle in each cerebral hemisphere. So we see, let me use black here, we see one lateral ventricle here, right? It goes all the way around like so. And then we see another one in the other hemisphere and you see its tail end over here, right? We can't see um, the most anterior end of it, but it goes in that direction. So we have therefore two C-shaped lateral ventricles and they're located in the cerebrum and they're separated near the anterior portion right about here by a membrane called the septum pellucidum. Your third ventricle runs right through the middle of our diencephalon. So this is where your thalamus would sit. Remember that little opening here we need to allow for the intermediate mass to pass through. And here we see more of the third ventricle, which runs through the, uh, in between the two halves of the hypothalamus. So this is our third ventricle 
So we have two lateral ventricles, then there's our third ventricle, and finally we have our fourth ventricle right here at the level of the brainstem, um, in between the brainstem and the cerebellum. Interconnecting the third and the fourth ventricle, we're going to see the cerebral aqueduct, which would be behind this anterior lateral ventricle. You can see it's connecting to the fourth ventricle here. So that's the lateral view. Now let's do the same kind of labeling in an anterior view. So here we have our two lateral ventricles in each, they're C-shaped, in each one of our cerebral hemispheres, LV for lateral ventricles. And they are separated right about here by the septum pellucidum. They are interconnected eventually right here and there are little openings on either side here before we make it into our third ventricle and these openings we refer to as interventricular foramina so foramen is singular if you are in lab you're familiar with this but if it's plural it would be foramina And so we have two of these interventricular foramina. Interventricular meaning in between the ventricles. And they allow for the cerebrospinal fluid to drain into our third ventricle. The third ventricle interconnects with our fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct right here. And the fourth ventricle is then going to drain into the central canal, which is in the very center of the spinal cord. As I've mentioned before, our ventricles and the central canal are lined with ependymal cells that are ciliated, and the cilia, or the beating of the cilia, keeps the CSF moving. In addition, we've mentioned before that hanging of the roof of the ventricles we have the choroid plexus. And of course, it's these capillaries that are going to be responsible for the making of um, the cerebrospinal fluid with the help of the ependymal cells. Notice too that coming off the fourth ventricle are these little branches that we'll refer to as apertures and they're going to allow for some of the cerebrospinal fluid to enter into the subarachnoid space. To see a nice three-dimensional rotating image, grab one of these two links here and try to get a better feel for how these ventricles are positioned in our brain. I am not going to include a movie here because it makes the file too big. Um, you can just use the links as I said, but we can perhaps use the left image to illustrate here our C-shaped ventricles. So this is um, a, a lateral ventricle and this blue one is a lateral ventricle. The yellow one is the third ventricle, recognize this opening here where the intermediate mass passes through. Here we have the CA for cerebral aqueduct, and then we have the fourth ventricle with its apertures, plus we have here the central canal that enters into the spinal cord. Let's make sure that we're all clear on where each one of these ventricles is located. So the lateral ventricles are located in the two cerebral hemispheres. The third ventricle runs right through the middle of the diencephalon. And the fourth ventricle is going to sit where the brainstem meets with the cerebellum. It's pretty important for you to understand
the flow of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, around the brain, in the spinal cord, and around the spinal cord. So let's take a look at this mid-sagittal cut of the brain. Let's first point out some structures that we have studied so far and to just orient ourselves. Remember, this is the anterior side of the brain and this is the posterior side of the brain. Um, you can see the cerebellum clearly. Here's your brain stem. This would be your diencephalon here. And then here we have the cerebrum with the corpus callosum and the fornix. And right here would be the septum pellucidum. So your lateral ventricles are going to be approximately here at the level of that um, corpus callosum more or less. You can see in the reddish right here the choroid plexus in your one of your lateral ventricles. Here we have our third ventricle with its choroid plexus over here. Here we have the cerebral aqueduct. And finally we have our fourth ventricle, this triangular region here, which also has a choroid plexus. So the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid is from the lateral ventricles and via the interventricular foramina into the third ventricle, from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, and from the fourth ventricle into the spinal cord's central canal, or via the fourth from the fourth ventricle via apertures into the subarachnoid space. One thing I forgot to also point out is notice the numerous arachnoid villi illustrated, actually just two, but you can imagine that there are more uh, illustrated on this diagram. So you can see how the cerebrospinal fluid, which is flowing, this is the light blue here, is flowing in the subarachnoid space is going to ultimately be returned to the blood, which is the venous blood that is darker blue, right? So the light blue represents the cerebrospinal fluid everywhere. The darker blue is going to represent the venous blood in the dural sinuses. So the arachnoid villi, they're responsible for returning the cerebrospinal fluid back to the blood. And anytime we return things to the blood, we call it reabsorption. So be sure you know this term, reabsorption. Production of the cerebrospinal fluid requires the choroid plexus, which means the little capillaries that we pointed out. Usually they hang off the roof of the ventricles because their plasma is going to be manipulated, you could say filtered, by the ependymal cells. So let's say that here is an ependymal cell, which kind of looks um, um, like an, a columnar epithelial cell. It has villi with which it makes the cerebrospinal fluid flow, all right? And these ependymal cells sit close to capillaries. So the blood in these capillaries, or the blood plasma, has a way of entering into our ependymal cells. The ependymal cells um, filter this blood plasma and what they release or secrete at the other end into, let's say, the ventricles or into the central canal or in the central canal, CC for central canal, of the spinal cord um, is going to be the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, during this whole process of the blood plasma being filtered by the ependymal cells, such that we can make cerebral spinal fluid for the ventricles or the central canal, um, since the blood is so close to the cerebral spinal fluid, there is an opportunity uh, 
for the waste materials that collect in the cerebrospinal fluid to be returned to the blood plasma here as well. We saw that this could happen at the level of the arachnoid villi um, also. So once again, notice that each one of the ventricles shows a capillary bed, and they're actually pretty well interconnected. Certainly the lateral ventricles, uh, certainly the cord plexus of the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. And we can see that here in this um, frontal section or coronal section. So here's the corpus callosum in this frontal section. We can see here the fornix, which runs from the anterior part of the brain to the posterior part of the brain. Here we see the two hemispheres of the thalamus, which tells you that right here, this is our third ventricle. And these are our lateral ventricles. And these red structures represent our capillary beds of the cord plexus. And so notice that they're interconnected between the ventricles. So the cerebrospinal fluid provides buoyancy to our brain and of course has many additional functions as you just learned. Um, we also learned about the meninges providing protection, of course our skull bones, our skin that covers our skull, the hair on our scalp. And then finally we have something called the blood brain barrier, the BBB. And as this terminology says, it's a barrier between the brain tissue and the blood. Are we saying that the nervous tissue in our brain is not exposed to all of our blood? That's correct. There are so many fluctuations in our blood. Remember that each time you eat and the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine and enter into your bloodstream, you're going to see major fluctuations in concentration levels of all kinds of uh, things in your blood. And many of those the brain will need. Let's think of glucose, for instance. Your brain cells, your neurons, must have direct access to glucose so that they can maintain their ATP synthesis uh, by means of aerobic respiration. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, those very small gas molecules that can very easily uh, reach the nervous cells. But, you know, in our blood, we also have a lot of waste products, possibly uh, leftover toxins of bacteria um, um, and, and various pathogens that have no business of entering our brain and creating havoc. And so that's why we have this so-called blood-brain barrier. What forms this blood-brain barrier is tight junctions between the simple squamous epithelial cells in the capillaries of the um, choroid plexus. So let's take a look at our diagram here. So in the very bottom here, we're looking at how our blood is arriving in the brain from a bigger artery. These are red blood cells and white blood cells in our blood. And then this bigger artery becomes a much, 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 much smaller artery called an arteriole, which branches, 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 and becomes a tiny, tiny, tiny capillary that is extremely small in diameter. And as you know, capillaries are made up of only simple squamous epithelial tissue. So the inner layer of any blood vessel is simple squamous epithelial tissue. But if we look at a bigger artery, we're going to see additional tissues, even smooth muscles, so that the artery can constrict and dilate. But by the time we get to a capillary, we're really only left with the simple squamous epithelial cells referred to as our endothelium, right? So this layer is the endothelium. Now, we see that in, the, in between the cells of our capillary, 
that there are tight junctions in the brain and therefore it gets very difficult for anything in the brain to get through these tight junctions. So we can't see things easily sneaking in between those cells of the endothelial layer. And therefore particles, let me indicate the particles as little stars, or pathogens and toxins, they're going to have to find a way to pass through the cells to make it into our uh, brain tissue. And, and mind you, I'm now actually at the, uh, drawing at the level of the arterial. Uh, let's pretend that we're still here at the level of our uh, capillary. And so let's discuss now what kinds of particles could or could not do this, and that is pass through these endothelial cells to make it into our brain tissue. We'll do that on the next few slides. Now, there's one more thing that contributes to the formation of the blood-brain barrier, and those are those little bulbous endings or those little hands at the end of our astrocytes. Remember those? Our astrocytes are star-shaped supporting cells in the CNS, and they're going to help stimulate with stimulate uh, forming these tight junctions between the endothelial cells. And the fact that they cover our endothelial cells is also going to make it hard for any particle to make it all the way into the brain tissue. So it's really important for our brain tissue, which of course is a bunch of neurons and supporting cells, for that environment to be pretty constant. Remember that our neurons are very responsive to ki all kinds of changes in their environment. A change in the environment is a stimulus, and any kind of a chemical change could potentially trigger an electrical signal, possibly an electrical signal we really don't want to happen. So many substances cannot enter into our brain tissue. Some substances can, as I mentioned earlier, glucose, various amino acids, lipid soluble molecules that are, not, that are harmless, uh, plenty of gases uh, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, and of course water. Now, there are some things that will pass into our brain tissue because of their features, and we don't have any control over this. Remember that cell membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer, so if a particle, a pathogen, has the ability to cross that cell membrane, then they can enter into our brain tissue. So for instance, heavy metals such as mercury and lead can pass cell membranes, which is why it's so dangerous to play with or be exposed to lead-based paint. Or if you drop a, an old-fashioned thermometer that still has mercury in it and you see the little droplets, thick droplets of mercury on the floor, you cannot touch those with your bare hands because that mercury will make its way into your body, possibly into your brain. Many drugs, including poisons, are lipophilic. And remember what that word means, lipophilic. It means liking lipids. And if they do, if particles or chemicals are lipophilic, they're going to be able to cross our cell membranes and make it into our well, make it through that endothelial layer, through um, the um, capillary wall into our brain tissue. And examples of chemicals like this are alcohol, nicotine, anesthesia, street drugs, and a bunch of neurotoxins. Now, we do find that there are areas in our brain that are not 
going to be protected by the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is just not present there. And these are areas of the brain that must be able to detect what's going on in the body. For instance, in the medulla, there is a so-called vomiting center that must be able to detect what is going awry in the blood so that we can possibly um, get a reflex going to where we vomit and, and on time get rid of some of the poisons. Our hypothalamus, remember that's our visceral control center, it again has to be able to detect what's going on in the body, whether it's hormone levels or various um, chemicals that uh, are altered because of respiratory rate, um, cardiovascular changes, and even our pineal gland. It's very interesting also what researchers, researchers dis discovered about stress. It's now known that stress can increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So the more stressed we are, the higher the chances are that things will pass and cross the blood-brain barrier um, while they really under normal circumstances should not. And we've also learned that at birth that blood-brain barrier is already present. Now we've reached our last slide and I'd like to apply some of this information we just learned about the black about the blood-brain barrier to something we studied earlier, and that is Parkinson's disease. I explained to you that Parkinson's disease is caused by dying neurons in the substantia nigra of the midbrain. These neurons normally produce dopamine, and we need that dopamine to moderate, to send inhibitory signals to the basal nuclei so that we can execute smooth, coordinated muscle movements, right? So when those dopamine neurons begin to die off, our skeletal muscles are not regulated properly anymore because our dopamine is not doing the is not creating the, the right amount of inhibitory signals in our basal nuclei anymore. So the obvious thing to think is, well, let's just give people who suffer from Parkinson's disease, let's just give them dopamine. Well, there is a problem. Dopamine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's not that simple to always, it's not always that simple, I should say, to treat a brain disease. We now have found a way to go around this dilemma. We can provide Parkinson's patients with something called L-DOPA, which is a precursor to dopamine, and it can cross the blood-brain barrier, and then the brain can convert it to a functioning dopamine um, molecule. And that works up to a point. Um, it doesn't work forever, unfortunately. But hopefully that example illustrates to you that we may know what the causes of the disease. We may know exactly what kind of chemical, what kind of neurotransmitter, what kind of hormone may not be produced properly um, in the brain, yet we can't easily treat the patient because of this blood-brain barrier. And so we have finally reached the end of the brain. It's a pretty lengthy topic, but also very interesting. Thank you so much for watching.